The AI's job is to learn everything it can about me from my photos. In theory, it should be able to answer questions for my daughters the same way I would. My daughter wanted to know how I felt the day she was born. When you asked that question, you provided a number of images. It went and found a picture that was relevant to the day of birth, and it used different types of AI wow. uh, to identify elements in that picture to come up with an answer. Welcome back. That was a clip from the new Crave original documentary opening the Hot Dogs Festival today, Artificial Immortality. The film explores how, as advancement in technology continues, what kinds of virtual immortality are waiting for us through the development of artificial intelligence? Here to tell us more about the film is the director, Anne Shin. Hi, Anne. Hi, thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining us. What a fascinating subject matter. So what we're dealing with is how perhaps technology can help us transcend death. Um, I, listen, this is artificial immortality. I think it's something that we're still kind of trying to wrap our heads around. But to start, is this kind of technology already in development? Yes, that's the startling thing. When I started researching into this, I realized all the things we just thought of as science fiction are now mm. science fact. Humans are merging with the machine. There are companies like Kernel or Neuralink, which are creating brain computer interfaces where things like a chip can be implanted in your brain and it can not only read your thoughts, but also write thoughts into your brain. And what? if that's not scary enough, I know, if that's not scary enough, there's biotech advancements where um, I, I spoke with a neuroscientist who was grow growing human brain cells in a petri dish and they were organoids, they're called brain organoids, and they were firing signals. They were working together oh. synaptically. And I saw him connect those brain organoids with a little robot and those brain organoids made the robot move. So humans are merging with the machine right now. And the film talks about the transhumanist movement. And these are people who believe that use, by using tech, they can actually transcend death, which sounds kind of like a Black Mirror episode. But what does this mean? And how can death be optional? Well, that's a great question. I, I was like, when I first heard that, I was like, yeah, right, right. But um, one of the transhumanists I talked to, his name is Gabriel Rothblatt with the Terrace Movement. He was saying that they believe that death is optional because the soul is data. So I don't know about you, but I like to think of myself as a bit more soulful than full of data. But like, if you were to think about your thoughts and all your memories, as uh, pieces of information. And even something like intuition could be seen as maybe the amalgamation and accumulation of all the experiences you've had. Plus, mm -hmm. you know, your personal predilections all kind of come together in a soup that become like intuitive snap judgments. If you think of it that way, they, you know, transhumanists think that our experiences, our thoughts and memories can be not only quantified, but they can be replicated. And if you can replicate that in AI systems combined with biotech, they think not only can we clone ourselves, but one day they believe we can transfer our consciousness and in that way, meet death. Almost like, like uploading on, on you know, like files onto a hard drive and then putting them onto something else. Yes, exactly. In the film, you explain the idea of like a mind file. So what is that um, and, and how does it work to achieve this particular type of immortality? A mind file is uh, basically all your memories, your thoughts, your photos, your videos, all the information that we generate about ourselves that can be combined to form like a time capsule portrait of who you are. Does that mean though that social media companies have access to all of our mind files? Yeah, I mean, you think of every time you like, you post up a photo of that dinner you created, or, you know, just a couple of days ago, I was tweeting about George Floyd's death, or, you know, you, you do a Google search for, about anything, you're leaving digital footprint, your, your trail of digital 
material out there. And companies like Amazon, Facebook, Instagram, Google, they have a complete profile of you. And, you know, one of my favorite writers, Yuval Harari, will say, you know, these companies know you better than you know yourself. And so these mind files already exist, even though like right now we're talking about it as if it's some transhumanist trend. It's actually all companies dealing with data and algorithms have these personality profiles of us already. Technology and computers and robots and artificial, a name that we don't expect to come up is spiritual guru Deepak Chopra. But uh, you do feature Deepak Chopra in the doc. In fact, there's something called a digital Deepak. It's an AI that you interacted with. T tell us about what it was like interviewing him. When I heard that I could talk to digital Deepak, uh, an AI clone of Deepak Chopra, I was like, okay, I'm going to try and trip, this, uh, trip up this guy. Like, you know, <laughs> what's this digital avatar going to know about things like life or death that... I'd want to learn from, you know, him rather than this app, rather than a real person. So I, I went in there and I was like, okay, I'm going to ask him the same question I asked the real Deepak and I'm going to compare how they answer. We both said the same thing, but you know, the real guy just had a lot more charisma and you know, I could touch him. <laughs> that was yeah. Nice. Yeah, okay. that. At the end of the conversation with digital Deepak, the, the, the person next to me was like, well, we'll say bye to him. And, and it was just kind of like, okay, bye Deepak. And it was interrupting him kind of. And I thought, wait a second, that's rude. Like, it was like, I was doing this to this, to the, to the app. And I, I would never do that to a real person. Although maybe sometimes you kind of want to be able to do that to a real person. Um, but it was weird because I had developed kind of feelings for this app, this avatar. Yeah. And thinking about him as a person and wanting to treat him like a person. That was weird. In the doc, you talk about your father having dementia and, and there was part of you that thought that would have been incredible. That would be incredible to have his memory files. And so you thought, Hey, this is something that I could do for my kids. And you decided to yeah. create an avatar of, of yourself. So your children could experience this sort of augmented could experience you in an augmented eternity. Please tell us or share what you can about what that was like, just creating an avatar of yourself. First, I had to go find a lot of data for the computer, like the AI developers to use. And that meant going through all my photos and videos and he fed it into the system and started to create the mini Anne or the avatar for me. How does this type of AI actually form a memory and does it bear any similarity to the way that our brains function when they can recall something so what it does is if let's say we ask a question about how did Anne feel when she was giving birth or the, the day that her daughter was born so it'll go through the archives of photos and find the photo of me with the newborn baby oh we'll look at the photo and to kind of see oh there's a sofa and there's a blanket on the sofa so it's likely at home, it's not a hospital photo. And then it'll take up, look at the facial features, the eyebrow, the nose, the mouth, to see what mood I was in and also who's in the photo. And then it'll formulate a sentence around that day of its own accord. So it said, I was relieved of stress and overwhelmed with happiness, which is not something I would say, uh, but you know, I, I was relieved of stress and overwhelmed with happiness and really relieved that there were no photos or videos of me when I was screaming in labor, you know? So the human brain, every time we tell a memory, we're recreating it, we're rebuilding it. So all the senses, the smells, the feelings, the thoughts, all are reconnected again when we form a memory. So each time we have a memory, it's a new thing that we're putting forward when we're telling our kid that memory. It's like. What you say today will be different from what you say about that same experience 10 years from now. A lot of us, I think, have been shaped by pop culture and that kind of storytelling about the robots, the machines. Um, and, you know, the horror story is that they become rogue and they get smarter than us. Is, is that a reality? It is. I mean, in the film, I show Facebook chatbots that went rogue. They were developed by developers to... Um, 
negotiate in the Facebook market, but to, to negotiate sales in the Facebook marketplace. Um, but they developed a, a coded language that the developers couldn't understand anymore. And so they had to shut them down. So that's just a small example. I mean, another example is much more complex systems of AI that have been developed and are being used right now that have, a, you know, heavier ramifications in terms of how advanced this AI technology has become and whether we can keep up with it or not. Um, a lot of mm -hmm. AI developers, they don't understand what an AI does to come at a solution anymore. It's like a black box. They don't understand because the AI is so fast and advanced. Thank you so much for this really <laughs> insightful and interesting conversation. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks. I really enjoyed talking about it. I hope people enjoy the movie too. And you can see the movie Artificial Immortality at the Hot Dogs Festival right now until May 9th. We'll be right back.